plasma site. Um, I also want to, to take a very particular perspective or stance when it comes to these materials and the use of simulation modeling because it factors in a major way, a central way, into understanding this vision of systems data science. And it specifically has to do with a view of dynamic models as learning tools, not merely crystal balls, to anticipate what's coming or to tell us what to do, but as ways of learning more quickly, deeply, and rigorously about the world, including critically from observations about that world. Okay? So I'm going to be taking a particular stance with respect to the use of simulation modeling here that's not merely happenstance from the perspective of the broader root camp. It is central to this synthesis of data science and system science that I can be articulating, including the ways in which we can use data science in the event of counterfactual changes to a system, system changes that haven't previously been observed, we intervene, we shift the data generating process, we shift the underlying patterns, and we need to learn as much as quickly as possible about the new reality in order to make informed decisions. So even those who have heard me articulate this perspective on simulation modeling uh, before will should, should recognize that I am articulating this because it's so core to the systems data science perspective that, that runs throughout this event. So the motivation for this event, for, my, for me, and, and really for our broader group, lies in growing complexity of health policy challenges, um, whether it's uh, the challenges associated with a uh, uh, growing society um, and complex, the growing uh, emergence of complex patients or the, the heavy burden of health disparities which confront us uh, within North America, um, or the syndemics of mutually interacting conditions, conditions that have traditionally been dealt with um, uh, separate, uh, but which are now, now uh, joined at the hip, uh, HIV and hep C, for example, or substance abuse and HIV transmission and hep C. Conditions which could be analyzed in isolation, but where they're so tied together that one's missing the boat with, if one doesn't deal with their interactions. Another one domestic violence, suicide, mental health, and addictions issues. Within these areas, um, uh, we're dealing with challenges, not merely because there's a lot of, a lot of things going on, and, you know, the system is complicated, there's a lot of moving parts, but because it's dynamically complex. Um, we're dealing with systems where the behavior of the whole is, is very different than the sum of the parts. And to understand the, 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 the syndemics involving multiple conditions, we need to look beyond the characteristics of each condition in isolation and reason about their interactions. Just as to really understand the progression of a patient who is subject to multiple severe chronic conditions, we can't merely use results from randomized clinical trials that were observed only for condition A only for condition B and only for condition C and expect to understand what the implications are for a given clinical intervention to help that patient. We need to understand their, their interactions. For example, how diabetes interacts with chronic kidney disease or interacts with, with uh, the, the, the burden of, of tobacco use, et cetera. So we're dealing here with systems where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And these systems are, at a technical level, dynamically complex. Um, we can be surprised by these systems. And not only do the systems behave in ways that are intellectually curious, they behave in ways that confound effective policymaking, often, naive policymaking. When we intervene in the system to try to effect change, our 
our, uh, the effects that we stir up are often pervasive, that we intervene in point A in the system. Maybe we, we um, uh, restrict the ability for, uh, for uh, primary care doctors to prescribe opioids for chronic pain. If we intervene in that way, the effects of that are writ large. The effects of that go beyond what happens in the, the, the uh, admitting area for that uh, PCP or in their, uh, their patient examination room. The effects end up affecting demand for treatment uh, for opioid addiction. It ends up affecting the number of calls that police get for opioid overdoses, for example. It ends up affecting the, uh, the, the demand for drug dealers' products of synthetic opioids such as fentanyl or carfentanyl on the streets. It ends up affecting across the entire system, ends up affecting in the, the, the health area for sure, the number of opioid overdoses, presentations at emergency rooms, um, the number of individuals who need uh, addictions counseling. It ends up affecting in the corrections and policing area in terms of dealer activity, in terms of, of uh, police exposure to, to fentanyl in um, trying to respond to overdoses, and then it's affecting social services, right? Families that are falling apart because of addictions. An intervention ends up rippling through the system, and often the systems behave surprisingly to that. We expect a change that we would like over here from our intervention, and like a balloon, we squeeze it there, and sometimes it pops out over there. It causes unexpected changes in distal areas of the system. And as a result, a narrow viewpoint often confounds our understanding of what will happen and prevents an effective solution because we're not anticipating these side effects. Often the link between an intervention or cause or a change we make or some cause triggered by external conditions its effect are often unclear because they are often delayed, distal in the system, they occur further out in the system, they're multifaceted and they're often reciprocal. There's, there's feedbacks by which A changes B and B changes A. And often these effects are nonlinear. There are tipping points in the system, changes occur at a systematic level perhaps for certain ranges of an intervention, but at some point we may reach a tipping point. We have enough vaccinations delivered that we've achieved effective herd immunity, even given the vagaries of clustering in our population, and the incidence of the disease plummets. Or we, we have a situation where uh, the the, the spread of um, HIV takes off in the population due to needle sharing um, because it's not being uh, effectively and quickly addressed by the public health system. So systems are nonlinear. Um, the effects of the interventions are not additive and, and we can have very different effects for different levels of response to intervention or changes. We see these sort of systems uh, all around. I had referred to, um, to the opioid uh, crisis. Another example is, is um, E.D. Waits. We, we uh, are fortunate and honored to have worked with our Ministry of Health uh, over the span of several years on, on the emergency department waits and, and, um, uh, and in terms of lowering the, the very long waiting times within emergencies. But one of the recognitions that comes from this is that although the symptom is in emergency rooms, you know, the amount of time you wait when you present for care and emerge, say with a cut finger or a, um, or, or a, a, a dangerous, uh, dangerous cough, the, if you look at where the causes of this lie, it lies well beyond emergency rooms. Um, we, we see the symptom there, but if we confine our attention to the emergency room, we'll often be missing some the biggest drivers for why there's long waits. It reflects the fact that people, that the beds are not free to emerge because people from eMERGE can't be discharged. 
why can't they be discharged? Because the wards are full of the hospital for, for acute care, for, for treating patients who have a wide variety of conditions or recover from surgery, are in for, for labor, or, or are uh, dealing with, with very severe uh, diseases um, uh, that have, have led them to stay there for long periods of time. The wards are full. And why are the wards full? Well, a lot of those patients can't be discharged to the community. And why can't they be discharged to the community? Because services are not available in the community for those patients. And the lack of community services also leads more people to present to the emergency room, which leads to a higher demand that is needed for conditions which don't require emergency treatment. So if you start to try to deal with emergency department waiting times, what you find is that a lot of the drivers for this relate to things so far outside the emergency you might never conceive of them at first glance. And they include, you know, a systematic under-resourcing of community care and community service alignment uh, compared to acute care and compared to eMERGE in a way that causes the system, so to speak, to go around in circles, um, to not make progress. It's that imbalance of the system. Not, it's not a problem at any one place. It's a systemic imbalance that's leading to this situation. And it leads to lock-in effects. And there's, it's uh, reflective of, of, of feedbacks and, um, and of um, disproportionate use of the system and heterogeneity. So, you know, the challenges for a lot of these systems are where do we invest most effectively to make a difference? Um, given this complexity, given the tangled nature of these systems, the fact that if I intervene here, it pops out over there. If I, if I try to change this, it, it ends up changing that. Where do I interact to most effectively change things? Well, one of the challenges that confronts us within these systems relate to, to getting a handle on the system is that if we're relying only on informal reasoning, we have some sort of idea in an inchoate way in our head, or maybe it's, it's a way we think is fairly clear, but it's, it's articulated in our head alone, and we're trying to reason about it and, and learn from empirical observations, that linkage um, between what we think's going on out in the world, or sort of dynamic hypotheses for what's going on out there, the underlying processes that underlie the patterns we observe, trying to relate that to empirical observations in a rigorous way is, is very challenging. Some fascinating experiments have been done at MIT in, in, in areas of um, uh, where a lot of modeling is done to test the degree to which High, it's, uh, tr individuals who are uh, doctoral students in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, such as in, in, uh, in, in the engineering sciences, who are highly trained in modeling, are asked to, to try to control a system or interpret a system's behavior. Uh, and it turns out that that relying just on their informal reasoning or their, their reasoning in their heads about this, they do a terrible job. They, they have some conceptual notion for how this system behaves. But in terms of our wetware, our, our brains, we're not set up to reason rigorously from our thinking, our conceptualization of a system to empirical observations. And especially when we are considering interventions on a system and how that would change things, we're dealing with an especially difficult area because often these interventions involve counterfactuals. We haven't observed their effects before. We're reasoning about these underlying processes is often shaky in the first place. And if we're relying only on informal reasoning to sort of imagine how would a given intervention affect this underlying system to bring us closer to some desired outcomes, often we can be woefully off. And indeed, these STEM students at MIT working with even very simple systems um, end up having terrible results for their attempts to control the system. It, 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 they tend to, tend to have very, very poor ability to achieve desired outcomes in very simple systems. Um, as a result, we get a lot of 
adverse consequences. We have counterintuitive behavior. We have misperceptions of the system. We interpret growing reporting of a condition as a sign of a crisis and underlying incidents, whereas it, it may, in fact, be a sign that the system's more effective in finding cases out there of that. We may have policy resistance, cases where we try to put in place a change, an intervention, and it ends up not having the effects that we wanted, or even having adverse effects, because if, if we squeeze it here and it pops out over there. Um, for example, maybe we undertake strengthening of the rules by which um, uh, opioids are prescribed for chronic pain, and we think, okay, that's going to lower the burden of opioid addiction because fewer people will get exposed to powerful opioids on a regular basis and fewer will get addicted. But in the short term, what we may see is individuals who no longer get the opioids from the doctors and are already physiologically dependent end up going to dealers and end up getting dealer street, street sourced opioids that are far less likely to control to be controlled in terms of dosing and might end up overdosing because of the limited availability in the um, catch and catch can availability of these um, and the dynamics that are induced for their, uh, for their drug tolerance and the fact that the dosing is so far off, there's um, collectively those can lead to a high risk of overdose. So in short, we can get policy resistance. We have best of intentions but it ends up thwarting the goals of the, uh, of the intervention or the broader policy. We can have disproportionate impact um, of our policies uh, on the flip side. Um, and uh, it behooves us to know about this, to recognize if we can just reach a certain level of intervention, we can achieve a qualitative change in the results, not merely not merely a little bit better by investing a little bit more, but at a certain point, investing a little bit more may lead to a lot better, a game change situation. And these phenomena pose problems if we're reaching off the seat of our pants and learning from experience, coordinating effectively, deciding between different strategies, and designing a system that's more efficacious. So to address these needs, um, for several decades now, really from the mid parts of the 20th century, um, a growing number of scientists have applied what has come to be called complexity science or system science. I like to term it in a, you know, in a sound bite, the science of the whole. The science of whole systems. Systems not merely reduced to their pieces and understood by taking them apart into their pieces but as a whole, okay? Um, just as a traffic jam, you're, you, you can't really effectively understand a traffic jam if all you know about is car axles and, and the drivetrains of trucks and braking capacity of trucks. That's part of the picture. But a traffic jam is about much more than its pieces, the cars and their constituents. We could spend all our time studying the makes and models of cars and their, their horsepower and, and braking capacity and grand vehicle weight and, and et cetera. But we wouldn't be closer to understanding traffic jams because traffic jams are a systems phenomenon. And to understand a systems phenomenon, we need to understand more than the pieces. We need to understand how all those pieces fit together and how that leads to a behavior for the system very different from what we'd see if we studied any piece in isolation. When you see a car, when you see a truck, you don't see the traffic jam. You have to understand how all these things fit together. And system science is the science of the whole. It can help us visualize, understand, and reason about the implications of the, of the underlying processes that drive the systems. So in a central way, in which system science aids us is through the use of dynamic models. This is one boot camp where you will actually hear me talk about other ways system science helps besides dynamic models. A lot of my boot camps, I just go right into dynamic modeling. And we spend our time discussing dynamic models. In this boot camp, you'll hear me appealing to other areas of system science and dynamic models. 
And these include dynamical systems theory components, this notion of delay embedding, this powerful notion that anyone time series of evidence from an underlying system actually whispers to us. It tells us a lot about the underlying system that gave rise to it. It encodes information about the dynamics of that underlying system, regardless of whether we have a model of it. It's there in that time series, the information about it. And we'll see that. But one of the central ways is through dynamic models. And these models help us share and reason consistently about the implications of hypotheses. And, you know, Josh Epstein has articulated, we don't truly understand phenomena until we can generate it. And I'm, I'm sympathetic to that, the generativist perspective. Until we can, we don't truly understand it, we can generate without presupposing it. Without, in some way, hard, you know, baking in to our, our understanding the fact that it, that it happens. Um, so simulation models can be viewed, and I think fruitfully are viewed. I'll, I'll take the stance that it's fruitful to view simulation models as dynamic hypotheses concerning what's going on out there in the world from a causal perspective. And the idea is we're articulating a causal theory of what's going on in the or for, uh, what's driving the processes out there in the world. This dynamic hypothesis for how things uh, work out there in the world that give rise to the data we see. In order to, to reason, a big motivation is to reason about counterfactuals. How would it be different if we change X or change Y? Not just locally, but in those pervasive ways across the broader system. See, I understand. So the idea is we, we articulate in these models some working hypothesis for the causal structure of the system out there, and we reason through um, its consequences. And by so doing, it allows us to say, well, if we change this, if we change that, what's the logical causal implications of that? Okay. Um, and all simulation models uh, represent at some level a computational realization of a, of a mathematical, uh, mathematical process. And there's many particular ways of defining these models. Okay? Um, so these models provide us a way, within a, a nutshell, to examine the system-wide consequences of changes in different areas of the system. Just as the systems we characterize are nonlinear, just as the systems we characterize exhibit pervasive causality, intervening here leads to changes that are often delayed or distal within the system. They pop out in weird areas of the system. So our models do. But our models we can experiment with in ways that would be unethical or infeasible or too long to undertake with the real system, higher risk with the real system. So models help us understand by, by understanding the logical consequences of a concrete theory, understanding what those consequences are logically, consistently, they help us understand system vulnerabilities and leverage points. They help us uh, reason about ways to fruitfully change system structure and uh, ways that the system design as a whole can be achieved. So a model like this depicts behavior of a system over time. It depicts it. It, it helps us understand the behavior over time that's induced by, that's the logical consequence of a theory captured in the model, a hypothesis captured in the model, a working hypothesis. Okay, um, And the idea here is that generally, for nonlinear models, you can't specify in closed form. You can't just write down an equation for how this system will evolve over time. Write down, oh, it's going to evolve as, you know, um, uh, t squared times e to the minus uh, t divided by two, or something like that. You, you, you can't do. You can't write down a formula that says how it evolves over time. Uh, we don't know how to solve in general nonlinear systems in a closed form way. Instead, we simulate it over time. And these simulations involve an underlying state of the system. At any one time, the simulation depicts a current situation of the world, the state of the world, as we say. And then over time, that state evolves in the model, just like over time, 
as we watch day in, day out, the state of this room changes, right? Right now, we have a bunch of people in this room. We will have a break later, and there'll be some people in this room, and some people who, 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 who leave, uh, go to Starbucks, and uh, and then, you know, uh, time all is on, we'll go to lunch, and, and the state of this room is changing. So it is in the model. It, it has an underlying state at any one time. If we freeze time, that's the current state of the model. And over time, that state evolves. Now, the model suspects by incremental changes or rate of change, given the current situation of the model, how is the system likely to change or how fast is it changing? In system dynamics, we use characterization of the flows, so how quickly the state is changing with respect to this aspect or that aspect, in what direction. With agent-based modeling, we're specifying most commonly the probability that it will change in certain ways. And same with discrete event modeling. System behavior, as in the world, is emergent. It emerges from a set of factors in the model that are interacting, much as a traffic jam and how bad it is emerges from a bunch of interacting cars that, that you know keep each other waiting and have limited visibility and and, um, and limited room to maneuver, et cetera. Um, because underlying systems exhibit nonlinear characteristics, model do as well. They have tipping points. They have nonlinear uh, non response to interventions, et cetera. So models here can be analogized to maps. Yes? So it's just in the last slide when we talked about the rate of change of systems. Yeah. So we, we don't just talk about the overall rate of change. Right? When you look at rate of change, we look at the rate of change of different flows, of That's flow correct. of the patients and flow of the correct. doctors and nurses. Correct. So there's no like there's nothing called the rate of change of the overall model. No, well, no, actually we we can fruitfully, and in fact in many spheres of modeling description, we do fruitfully take those sort of local descriptions of change, which occur in system dynamics with flows, right? We say this flow depends on these stocks in this way. This other flow depends on these stocks in this way. This flow is constant into the system representing you know, some constant rate of immigration or whatever, right? We, it's true that we have sort of localized description for this flow or that flow. And similarly, in, say in an base model, if we have a state chart, we have a certain, for, for this transition, the, the chance of developing diabetes, you have a certain probability of transitioning across that, right? Um, and this other transition involving chance of, you know, losing insurance in the states, you, you have a certain probability of transitioning. So it's true that we, for convenience, we, when we characterize a model, we, for different pieces of a model, we say how, you know, how how quickly is that changing? Or what's the probability, the hazard rate by which this changes? Or what's the timeout by which you know an individual, um, for example, uh, spends time in a, in a doctor's office for a discrete vaccine? So it's true that we describe it in kind of a, a way that relates to these pieces. But collectively, we'll sometimes summarize the rate of change of a model as a whole as sort of a vector if we think about a system dynamics model, we, we actually will, can fruitfully think of it as a vector of a rate of change for the whole system state that just summarizes each of those pieces and gives uh, what the implication is for the whole system state. And similarly, it turns out for, for agent-based models and discrete event simulation models. And so it, it is true that we describe it in a localized way. But the simulation software turns that into, over time, it turns it into a change across the entire system that's simply a composition of those, those changes in individual areas of the system. So we can view that as a vector? So yeah, we, example, yes, correct. Sorry, just the case of like emergency room kind of thing? Yeah. So we can, like, if someone asks, OK, so what is the overall rate of change for this case? Sure. Then we can be like, OK, I'll just like this three notes. The first one is that we look at rate of change of the, the doctors, the flow of doctors, the flows of the patients, yep. the flow of nurses. 
and they would just study the reactions of those three components that, that, that's and right. map them into a that, That's right. I mean, so commonly, you know, you'll have a, a, a system like this, and we'll have, you know, flows uh, between variables like this, right? Um, and, um, you know, we'll have well, something like this. Uh, and, and what you're saying is, you know, we specify, like in a system dynamics models, these rates have changed here. And some might be nonlinear, right? If, let's suppose this is new infections. It might depend on, maybe I'll make it more concrete and less, less abstract here. So this could be SIR. These are infectives. These are susceptibles. These are recoveries, right? And the number of new infections, which is this flow, how many people transition from a susceptible to an infective state, it, it depends in a nonlinear way, right? Um, it, it, if it were linear, it would depend on one state variable. Here it depends on a product, right? So, so it's actually something that involves S times I um, and some other factors, right? Um, so, you know, I can write it C times beta times S sub I over N, right? Um, uh, is, is this rate of flow. And similarly, maybe I have a, a death rate that applies for infective individuals that's given by that. And notice this rate of flow depends on the state of the system. This rate of flow, how many people are going down here and dying from infection depends on the state of the model, right? I, here linearly, right? And here maybe there's some recovery time tau, right? and we have I over tau, um, right? So these are three flows, right, associated with the system. And uh, I would argue here, if, if this is what you've got, maybe we have a, a flow in of, you know, of, of births, right? Um, call it B, right? Um, I could write this down. I don't want to scare people, but I'll, I'll just write it down, right? So if I were to deal with the rate of change of S, right? I could say the S dt, or I could write it down in Leibnizian way as S dot, right? Uh, equals B minus C beta S I over N, I divided by N, right? Um, so inflow minus outflow. What, what determines its rate of change is the net flow, right? If this equal this, if people are getting affected just as fast as they're being born, the people are getting infected still, but S is unchanging, right? Because they're being replaced. Every one who goes out is replaced by one who comes in, right? So I could write this down. I could write di dt, right? Generally, you don't see this when you're doing system dynamics models. You don't have to do this, but under the covers, this is what's going on. And sometimes it's very useful to, to know that. We can use it to draw beautiful things like fixed points and so on. Anyway, here we have you know, C beta, C beta S I over N coming in, um, and and then uh, I over tau going out, right? This guy here, right, is a minus. Um, and then the RDT equals, oh wow, um, okay. Uh, I have additional markers here. Thanks, I, I, I've, I've got them covered, thanks. And I know Wade is like, the Boy Scout, he like, <laughs> awesome. Wade is incredibly resourceful, uh, but I will, I, I'm determined not to tap his large ass. Um, okay, so I could write this down, and then I could reformulate this entire system in a, in a, a vector manner by saying, you know, S I R, the rate of change of this equals some function of. So this is a vector, right? Um, uh, some function of SIR here. I could reformulate it in a vector way, and that's a very fruitful way to do it. This is just, this is just the sort of the, 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 the each element is just each of these rates, and 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 it, and this is nonlinear. It's it's no, it's not impoverished. It's just kind of bookkeeping. It's just keeping them together. This is the rate of change of S of I and of R as a whole quantity is equal to some function. This is the whole function here. This is F, you know, collectively, some function of this, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and it turns out we could think of that also in a, in an Asian-based model.
thing. Um, I'm, I'm glad to answer more questions about that offline. Just don't want to go too much into the, the math of it right now for because, because of the diversity people. Um, um, I'm glad to nerd later. <laughs> Happy to. Um, okay, so, um, so models, I argue, are like math. Models are like maps in many ways. One way is that they represent things in the world. Another way is they are useful because they simplify. They, they represent things in the world in a way that's simpler than the world. If we, if we had to navigate across Saskatoon from the airport in a rental car using a map that was the size of the world, it would offer limited value. But it's precisely because a map is smaller it on our smartphone screen, or we can you know, have it next to us, that it's useful. And not only are models simplifying in general, they're simplifying in a way that's specific to purpose. So if you wanted to bike from the airport to here, you'd use probably a different map showing bike routes than a car map. Or if you want to find out why there are brownouts occurring in town, or, or where the flooding occurs in town, you'd use a different sort of map electrical map or a map of topography, et cetera. Um, so um, I, I would argue that what you leave out depends on the model purpose. And, and all models, like all maps, are wrong, but they can be very useful for a particular purpose. They can be good enough. The image used in Pawson and Tilly's critical realist literature, which I'd recommend very strongly to anyone. Um, uh, I think it's in realist evaluation is out of a pontoon bridge over a swamp. The idea is, um, is the bridge good enough for purpose to get you across the swamp, to be able to reason reliably about a system for, the, for what you're seeking to, to, uh, to, to use it for? Um, not whether it is you know, the perfect bridge or the, um, you know, the, an immutable um, object. It's, it's good enough for purpose. Um, Okay, um, so um, a common concern is model scope, and that that's going to uh, be a, a key key thing for many modeling projects. But I won't go into it, um, other than to note that often we very clearly reason about what things are produced in a model, are endogenous in a model, what things are exogenous, are assumed, are represented assumed but in a pre-specified way what things are ignored. And it turns out that when it comes to integration of dynamic modeling and data science, this distinction is quite useful. Because there are some ways in which we'll integrate data science in an exogenous way. For example, um, in this very room, um, Winchell uh, Chen, uh, a, a doctoral student, student of remarkable depth um, and breadth of knowledge, will share with us uh, some models which uh, he's been running, which use network data as gathered through his smartphones. And within these smartphone models, the network data is fed into the model as an input over time. So, so in the simulation of infection spread, individuals are connected with others at certain times and disconnected with others. It's a dynamic network at other times, uh, according to the collected data from a diversity of studies. I think it's from six or seven different studies. Um, and uh, that's, that's plugging in data in an exogenous way. We drive the model. We feed the model from our big data into the simulation model. But in many, in many other models, we, we are actually matching up model expectations with external data, and we either calibrate to it, or we filter it, we, we engage in particle filtering, or particle on CMC, uh, against endogenous quantities. And depending on what we're measuring from the world and what we have in our model, how we use the data to interface with the model will be different. We'll be seeing this. Okay. So, the, the stance I want to take here is models as learning tools. And so they're not crystal balls, but uh, in the words of my uh, Australian colleague Jeff McDonald, uh, learning prostheses. Um, this may seem like a strange analogy, um, 
how can a model possibly, okay, a crystal ball is something that you could use to look forward to predict or forecast. That seems vaguely sensible, but, a, but an artificial leg or a crutch or a cane, how can a model be analogized to that? Well, bear me out on this. Um, some years ago, beyond the historic memory of any graduate student in this room, um, I broke my foot here on campus. Okay. Um, in fact, I broke it twice and I uh, sprained my ankle. Um, and uh, I was in bad way for, uh, for a number of months. I think I was off my foot for, uh, for you know, four months, five months. Um, no students, I couldn't bike. It's in bad a lot of the time. It's bad, it's bad news. Um, but, um, I, I used a boot to get around, and initially I used a crutch. <laughs> Cheryl, Cheryl would remember that time period. Um, I don't know if she was sitting in my class that year, but I, I came directly from the emergency room to teach my modeling course. Um, and I had to apologize to the students because I wouldn't be walking today in front of them, which I am now. So the idea here is I depended on crutches. I depended on the boot because of my physical limitations. I had limitations of what I can do, and I needed to get around. I needed to get to my class. I needed to get home. Right? I needed to get to the bus. And so I'd, I'd use my crutches uh, to do that. Same thing with a cane. Same thing with an artificial leg. We, we complement our limitations using prostheses, right? Um, and so it is with models. But the limitations are not physical. They're not a broken leg or a gimp foot or a, you know, a, a, a missing arm. They are cognitive limitations. We have limitations that confront us that are profound in terms of certain spheres of behavior. One of them, as those experiments from MIT have shown, one of them, ladies and gentlemen, is, has to do with, um, with the, um, uh, the occurrence of uh, reasoning about complex systems. So simulation models help us learn more quickly by helping us deal with our cognitive limitations. They assist us in a task we're very poor at ourselves. We don't achieve full function by ourselves in an unassisted way, which is reasoning through the implications of our assumptions as captured in a model. Often our assumptions are inchoate in our heads. We, we don't fully express them on um, uh, in our heads, they're, they're often latent um, inconsistencies in our thinking, cognitive dissonance. But when we take them out of our heads and we write them down explicitly, we put a stake in the sand and we say, well, take this as our working hypothesis. We can use the simulation model to reason through the consequences of that working hypothesis. And it isn't that that working hypothesis is necessarily true but that by putting it into an explicit form, we will sooner realize where it's off base and be able to improve it. It isn't that we want to privilege this hypothesis as some crystal ball, that this is the truth, but rather by, by putting it out there for the world to critique, see, and help us refine, and by putting it out there critically to ask what the logical implications are, we can test it in the crucible of empirical evidence against observed data. We can take this kind of theory about what we think is going on in the world. You know, we don't think there's a, a latent period E here. And we can take a model that's couched like this as a working hypothesis and say, what would the implications of this be? You know, go figure. Tell us what the behavior will be implied by that once we specify the parameters and the initial values of the stocks, of course. And, and then we can take the consequences of that logically and we can compare it against data from the world. We can say, does this jive? Is this aligned? Is it, is it consistent with data we see? So models like this help us think through the consequences of our assumptions, the so logical implications of our assumptions, more consistently, quickly, thoroughly, and rigorously. And therefore, we can and, and see where I'm going. This is going to be a huge thing, right, in this, in this boot camp. Whatever empirical evidence we have, like from data science, 
we can put it to use more effectively by saying, does this fit in with the model? Or what does it tell us about the model? Where does it tell us the model's off base? Um, and we can use this to then inform our, our understanding and advance our understanding, including refining our models and refining our thinking about the world. So this is kind of evolution of our thinking, put it in a model, see the logical implications, that ain't right, and refine our thinking and then observe things from the world and test it and maybe eventually undertake interventions and, and see if, if those align with what the model expected. Um, and the idea here is, remember I argued earlier that if you just have some inchoate ideas in the world and you have empirical observations, you're not sure how they jive, right? So you have some understanding of, of, of what's going on in the world and you have a theory there's increasing incidence. Um, and you, you want to say, you know, would this explain the increase in chlamydia incidence that we observe historically if there's this arrested immunity hypothesis as laid out by Broadham? If we just do that in our head, we're, we're bound to make mistakes, uh, bound to have oversight, bound to be off in our understanding the implications if we rely on informal reasoning. But if we, if we do so with a model, now it will reliably tell us. It will do lots of simple things quickly, lots of dumb little things quickly. That's what, that's what computers are good at. That's one thing they're very good at, is taking the logical consequences of something and saying, does it, what are its logical consequences? So we can match it against empirical observation. Same thing with, if we're considering alternative policies or interventions, we could say, come on together, do those yield desired outcomes that we're seeking to address or not? Right? Um, if we rely purely on our informal reasoning, or if we rely on statistics generated by the current data generating process, um, we may be in a really bad way to try to understand the consequences of an intervention. Because interventions alter the data generating process, they alter the pattern seen in the world, and therefore, they alter the associations. And therefore, if we're counting on those associations, we might be bitterly disappointed to see that our cherished reliance on them disappoints when it comes to, to the desire, not yielding the desired outcomes. And similarly, if we rely on uh, informal observations, only uh, doing this in our head is difficult. Yes, Olivia. What do you mean by interventions uh, alter the data generating process? What I mean is, when we undertake an intervention, let's, let's consider the case of the opioids example, okay? So we restrict the ability for primary care physicians to prescribe opioids to chronic pain patients, okay? We, we rely, um, we, we, we restrict the, the, the length and strength of the opioids that they can restrict in the class of patients. I understand Australia, for example, has a much more um, a much more limited set of circumstances in which opioids can be prescribed for for uh, chronic pain patients. Imagine that we were to just today decide to institute that for Canada as a whole or for Saskatchewan in particular. If we were to to have previously, till this point, compiled some statistics, for example. Um, uh, of overdose cases, what fraction um, have ever been given uh, prescribed antibiotics? What fraction sorry, prescribed, prescribed uh, opioids? What fraction um, first encountered opioids in through prescriptions? If we were to look at the fraction of opioid users who are disordered or who go on to develop to acquire opioids through illegal means through illegal sourcing, through dealers, let's say. If we were to compile those statistics before we undertook that intervention, and then we were to undertake that intervention, okay? We, we, we change what prescribers can, can do, and we consider what plays out over the next year or two. I would argue that, uh, so, and, and this is not based on idle conjecture, it's based on some experience from other jurisdictions. Individuals, there's a class of latent individuals out there with great confidence um, who have a physiological uh, reliance on opioids. Okay? Um, 
Uh, some of those individuals uh, may be confabulating symptoms of pain and getting opioids for feeding a, a growing tolerance to opioids, feeding their addiction. Others may have chronic pain but have come to rely on the opioids uh, physiologically um, to deal with pain. If that, that source for doctors ceases, a lot of those individuals may seek opioids through other sources that are illegal in character by diverting them from others, other family members, or getting them off the street, um, getting them from dealers. Um, that I would argue that that change will change those statistics I mentioned earlier. Um, because the underlying situation has changed from which the data is being gathered. The patterns in the underlying system uh, have been altered about where opioid uh, opioid users go, the paths they travel through the system, their ability to obtain opioids through through prescribers versus through other sources, and that's going to change the statistics. So the op so the associations we see in the world between A and B, between you know original chronic pain um, needs and um, uh, you know an overdose risk will be changed as a result because we've changed the underlying situation from which those measurements are made. We end up, the the associations noted in those measurements will be different. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, yeah. Um, I, I don't see a problem uh, of the process because the uh, goal is to find the most optimal outcome. Correct. And if by inter uh, change the policy, change the intervention, we can get the different set of data which has different outcome, then that achieves our goal, right? So if implement implementing uh, intervention A will have a worse outcome, then we don't implement it. And if like uh, implement like uh, intervention B have a better outcome, Correct. As long as we can reason about the counterfactuals, where this, where so there's no problem with the the system system data science approach I'm laying out here. In, in fact, it's why I'm articulating it. Where the problem lies is if you're relying on the associations to hold. For example, if you're relying on um, you know a some association between uh, you know, originally being a chronic pain patient and risk of overdose being low based on historic uh, situations and you're changing the rules and counting on that still being the case. Which is, uh, believe me, I've seen cases where people know, okay, you know, these... Uh, in, in this particular common in, in some areas of data science using uh, black box models, um, you know, we, we uh, note an association between this outcome and this feature, this, this risk factor, or this, uh, this covariate, this particular characteristic. Um, therefore, the idea is because there's a high association between them, all we have to do is lower the covariate and it will lower the, uh, the value of the association. I'm uh, sorry, it will lower the outcome, the, the risk of the outcome. So, you know, this, this given feature is associated with a high risk. By lowering the feature, therefore, we can lower the risk. It doesn't always work that way. It's, yeah. you're, if you're intervening in the system, it may alter those associations in profound ways. System science gives us a way to grapple with this. David, like if we're just observing the associations and counting on them, it's perilous. Yes. It's perilous. Because the intervention may not be the genuine cause of the outcome. It may be like a, the hidden, like a... That's right. There, there, yes, so there, there can be... Uh, th there can be other pathways by which it's contributing. Absolutely. So this, this idea um, of... Uh, you know, of, of use of models, taking some understanding of the world as a working hypothesis, putting it out there and having it tested in the crucible of empirical evidence and of critique from others is something that goes way back. Francis Bacon in the 1700s or 1600s, early 1600s, you know, argued truer, truth will so sooner come from error than from confusion. The idea is fail early, fail often. You know, um, try something, try some working hypothesis 
see if it works. Some work in hypothesis about how things are in the world. Test them. Is this consistent with the data? Is this consistent with existing data? Is it consistent with new data? Is it consistent with the effects of an intervention? And if not, improve it. So the idea here is model is not a crystal ball. A model is a tool to get us to spot more quickly where our thinking is off so we can improve that thinking and improve the model. It's a step towards an end. Yes, Trino. Uh, regarding uh, regarding the, the model and the system structure and the ability of model capturing the system structure, actually, do you think there's kind of evolution from the first it's a pure kind of model and then the pseudo, uh, the model uh, kind of capture the pseudo structure and then quality structure and the real structure? That's a very good question. I believe there is prospect of that in system data science and I'll try to give I'll try to give a pointer to that. Um, uh, and I do believe that the logical, where these techniques that I'll be presenting this boot camp are going is, will involve over time going beyond learning about the latent structure of the system, parameter values, et cetera, to learning about which model characterization is most effective, most efficacious, and towards deeper understanding of the underlying dynamics of the system um, by, by you know, alternative model structures and, and model structures that are more robust and more generalizable. Um, and I'll see if I can give a nod to this at a couple times during the boot camp, because writ large, 20 or 30 years out, particularly, I see this as being a big contribution of system data science. And arguably within the next, um, the next 10 to 20 years, there's going, to, there's going to be a growing amount of this. Already we're seeing evidence of it, whereby we can learn about more effective model structures, not just more effective particular assumptions about models um, over time and use that to refine our understanding of the underlying theory. And to do so, um, not merely limited to human reasoning, but to reasoning that can be automated and sharpened through uh, machine assistance. But there's another trend that's, that is counteracting this kind of- Indeed. I mean, for the machine learning. Indeed. People thought, okay, they have, as long as you have enough data, and you have supercomputing Indeed. power, and then you no, I need need to know the structure. But, but which, yeah. So I will be presenting, so uh, I am familiar with such models. We work with such models in our group to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. I believe they have a strong place in certain spheres. Where they tend to encounter real challenges, and I'll come back to this, I don't want to dwell on it exclusionary now, but where they tend to encounter real challenges is in two major things. Ironically, the first of them I consider less, less critical, but very important, um, but it's more widely talked about, it's explanatory value. The ability to explain a model to others. And this is part of the social learning, right, that goes on by, by, by putting a model out there and having a discussion about it, we, we welcome critique that sharpens our thinking. That's an important part of the sociology of modeling, is, is having a model that has explanatory value. And indeed, if we want people to rely on that model, to, to seek, seek guidance from that model, or to, to lend it credence, it, we, we, we will be uh, at risk if we don't have it in a situation where it can be explanatory. If we just say, trust this black box, you know, that does not engender trust and confidence on the part of, of, of others. But I would argue that a deeper issue there is the issue of, uh, of, of counterfactuals, of needing a model that, that will be robust in the event of changes that haven't yet been observed. And, and if we're relying purely on data that's been observed to this point, and we are uh, then, then often we are uh, counting, if we're doing so in a black box way, 
that's not seeking to capture the causal underpinnings of the system, we are setting ourselves up for a fall. Because if the patterns of the system change from what's been observed historically, such as through intervention or external exogenous factors, those patterns may no longer hold, and the prediction, the, the vaunted prediction of our model may fall short. And, and if you are just counting on raw prediction, the capacity to predict outcome based on lots of data, and you're not taking into account the causal structure, which, which typically means theory um, of the mechanisms of the model, then you are setting yourself up for fall for a change situation. Now, if you're recognizing faces, or if you're trying to calculate, um, you know, matches to uh, that are are predictive of um, some outcome absent intervention, you may be able to do a pretty good job with a black box model. But if you are dealing with the situation, you know, we're not we're not changing our face, the structure of the human face in a big way. There's no interventions. I guess plastic surgery or something. But um, there's not a lot of intervention. <laughs> I better not go there. Um, there's, um, you know, interventions involving faces are not the big concern of face recognition algorithms or, or algorithms to, you know, um, to diagnose based on genes, right? Um, genetic um, implications in terms of linkage to certain conditions. You're not altering the human genome in a profound way over time, so you're not dealing with counterfactuals. But, um, but I would argue that in many spheres where we are dealing with interventions and where we have to make a decision which will change the system, that will make black box reliance on sheer prediction, supercomputer generated or not, hard. And I will note that we can make good enough uses of supercomputers with our types of system data science. Thank you very much. Yeah. So the way I understand it is that uh, the, this um, a phenomenon arises because of infinitely many dimensions. And uh, modeling can only characterize finite many dimensions. For example, face, uh, facial recognition, it can only characterize like genes or like specific, specific dimension. But for machine learning, since it only uh, uses the data, it doesn't give any assumption. So it uh, it doesn't like a, like a, it does like the, there doesn't have a there is no limitation on the like finitely many like. Well, okay, so so uh, there's many things going on here, and we're going to go into this in more detail. So I don't want to delay us uh, uh, too much at this juncture. There are some types of machine learning that impose less upfront assumptions. There are other types of machine learning. For example, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian multi-level models, Bayesian graphical models, uh, uh, even things like support vector machines and so on, which which do have certain assumptions, you know, built built into them. And in fact, for for Bayesian approaches, certain theory. Um, but yes, you are right that some of the most uh, widely heralded and uh, elevated <laughs> uses of machine learning, such as those with deep learning. Are um, uh, are uh, talked about sometimes as if they are theory-free science. They don't involve, you know, a, a presupposed theory being imposed at the system. They can represent a wide, a huge, vast array of different theories. What you find, though, from dynamical systems theory is, in fact, that while nominally systems can have arbitrarily large dimensions. The actual, the actual dynamics of a system can allow us to articulate an intrinsic dimensionality of the system that's often incomparably lower than its nominal dimensionality, than its theoretical dimensionality. The systems that we observe in the world, while we could characterize them in an arbitrarily detailed manner, um, as having an arbitrary large number of dimensions. If you actually look at their evolution over time, this is an insight from dynamical systems theory, from system science that's not merely reducible to dynamic modeling. Their dynamics is actually tends to be very low dimensional. Okay, it tends to be 
And, and it reflects the fact that many of the nominal dimensions of the system that we, that we might talk about, the infinite dimensions you might use to characterize this system and all sorts of different measures, they're, they're highly, highly related to one another. They're highly coupled. And when we're dealing with systems in the world, real world systems, such as we're dealing with in the health sphere or many other spheres, we're dealing with coupled systems where what's going on in one area of the system is so tied up with what's going on in the other areas of the system that what it actually occupies is a small, it actually exercises only the smallest sliver, a manifold we talk about in, in a mathematical sense, of the entire space. And what this means is that, that um, we don't need to actually characterize everything to reason about any one thing. We actually can reason about the system in a very, very low dimensional way with, with enormous insight. And I think it is an open question and one that is subtle because it involves overfitting and involves sufficient quantity of data, and it also involves the particulars, the analytics methods. It is very much in question whether just throwing more data at it and trying to observe patterns in some, in some unstructured way uh, will necessarily capture the underlying intrinsic dynamics associated with the causal structure of the system. I do believe, and I will argue later, that, um, that the causal structure of the system can be discovered um, and will, um, will be, can be elicited uh, to growing richness through data science techniques combined with system science techniques. I am skeptical that just throwing more data from different areas of, of a system will, will allow the uh, intrinsic dynamics to come out in a way that would be robust to counterfactuals if left unassisted by some degree of, of theory. Okay, But I'll, I'll talk more about this later. Um, okay, so models give us this systematic way of replacing confusion uh, with learning, not because they, they give us a crystal ball that is the truth or the correct situation, they allow us to, they alert us more quickly when our cherished thinking is off base. Um, they allow theorizing concerning what's going on out there that more quickly spots when we're off base in our theorizing and allows us to correct it. And even putting forward a good model advances knowledge, can be a success by spotting inconsistencies um, with our assumptions, between our assumptions and the evidence. Inconsistencies between the logical consequences of our assumptions and the evidence. In short, when a model fails to match some observations from the world or match the experience of those in the system, it should be viewed not as a failure of the model, but a success of modeling. If we turn that around and advance the model, we say, okay, what have we missed? We need to account for this or we need to account for that. And one of the best ways to assist that it will turn out is data science and, and evidence that's gathered in a high velocity way and in a way that's, that's rich. Um, so simulation models have many uses. Um, the most basic is making explicit a, a model of causality, um, putting it out there for the world to critique, refine collectively. They help us in learning faster, more deeply from evidence, and they help in uh, management of complex systems, serving as what-if tools to identify effective policies evaluate benefits of restructuring the system in some way, understand and interpret trends, and prioritize data collection of great importance in the data science sphere. We use dynamic models to ask which data would be most useful to collect, which data would is actually needed to collect, how quickly, how much velocity do we need to really enhance reliably our understanding of the system and what at what point is it icing on the cake, or at what point is it overkill and expensive overkill at that? And to understand classes of context in which certain strategies can be generalized or best applied. Now, there are several types of system science models we're going to be seeing, and I just want to give a nod to several of them. Agent-based modeling system dynamics are the main ones we'll see in this boot camp, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time with system dynamics models because they lend themselves particularly well 
to examination um, for confluence of data science and system science. Um, cognate areas here include compartmental modeling um, uh, and mathematical modeling, as is termed. And this is a tradition that goes back to the 1600s at some level for physical systems and to the early 1900s uh, with the work of, of Ross, uh, particularly for malaria in 1920s with Kermick and McKendrick. Um, and is very useful for understanding many phenomena historically, such as dynamic complexity with childhood infectious disease um, uh, and many other phenomena. Um, system dynamics as a technique um, goes back to the mid 1900s, including in its application um, in uh, business and uh, societal areas. And there's a wide variety of, of techniques uh, which, which are used in system science techniques. The one we're going to be talking about the most is stock and flow models um, or mathematical models, which have uh, ordinary differential equation underpinnings. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but what I do want to talk about is the relationship between stocks and flows, because this will be key for understanding certain models that I'll be showing you, um, and that others will appear in uh, case studies. So the idea here is we build system dynamics models out of a set of building blocks. And at the most elemental level, the most basic level, the building blocks come in the form of stocks and flows. Above that level, we have what we call molecules, or, or these broader pieces. They're kind of like patterns in the software engineering area. Um, things like first order delays, or nth order delays, or, or uh, the, the types, of, uh, uh, types of systems we have with co-flows, et cetera. And the idea here is that stocks the current state of the system is represented in stocks, and that determines the rate of change of the system as captured by the flows. And the speed of those flows changing, how quickly, say, a flow is flowing into a stock, will in turn determine how the stock changes over time. So the current state of the system dictates the rate of change, and the rate of change dictates how that system evolves. Um, so, for example, we might have susceptibles, exposed, infectives, and over time, individuals uh, develop infection. That depends on the presence of infectives as well as susceptibles. And uh, these stocks, uh, at any one time, we could freeze the system. We can count the number of people in each of these categories, for example. And uh, as the system plays out, um, uh, the flows will be flowing into those stocks. The value of those flows at any one time is set by the value of the stock, of the stocks in which they depend. And uh, if this flow, for example, has lots of people flowing into exposed and few people are completing latency, exposed will be going up. The inflow is greater than the outflow associated with stock, or the sum of inflows is greater than the sum of the outflows. Stock will have a value that's rising. Uh, if the reverse is true, have value that's falling. If the rate of inflow is equal to the rate of outflow, the stock will be in stasis. Now, these models um, are built out of these building blocks. Stocks are the state of the system. They represent the current situation in the system. Um, and mathematically, the term state variables are compartments. Compartmental modeling, widely used in the health sciences, particularly for mathematical epidemiology. And uh, the compartments there typically represent the count of here people, um, uh, for example, that have certain characteristics. Um, you notice that we divide up the model. We divide up people according to their characteristics. So we have susceptible, separate from exposed, separate from infected. And each given stock is assumed to be pretty homogeneous. We don't keep track of each individual in a stock. Um, they seem to be well mixed or, or kind of uh, more or less interchangeable within a stock. Um, so we don't keep track of how long somebody has been infective in this stock here, but rather they're all clumped in infective uh, in the infective group, and each infective will have the same chance per unit time of recovering as any other infective. 
Um, the stocks are the quantities that can be measured at an instant in time. If you froze time, you can determine the value of the stocks. They start with some initial value, and after, their evolution depends only on the value of the flows on which they depend. So if there are flows in and flows out, the stock has some initial value, and after that, how it rises, how it falls, will be dictated by the values of the flows. Again, if the outflow is greater than the inflow, it will tend to drop. If the inflow is greater than the outflow, it will tend to rise. If the two are equal, it will be in stasis. Um, and uh, these are shown as rectangles in these diagrams. It is notable that if we need to distinguish between different classes of individuals, let's say males and females, we want to distinguish how many males are infected versus females are infected, or different age groups. Um, what we need to do is stratify the model by those categories. So we have male infectives and female infectives. We have male susceptibles and female susceptibles. Male exposed, female exposed. Male recovered, female exposed. Uh, uh, recovered in each of those stratifications of flows associated with them between those stocks. So these subscripts are be very important. Ladies and gentlemen, in the models that you'll be seeing tomorrow, particle filtering models, the model is actually further stratified by particle. Each particle represents a kind of hypothesis for what's going on in the world. It will have its own view of the world in terms of number of people in each of these stocks. Okay? Um, so that subscripting uh, will be, will be a, a key part of, of what we see. Um, so these are stocks, for example, within a model. Um, stocks are extremely important. They determine the current state of the system. They dictate most disequilibria. So if we have decay over time or memory of a system, you know, like immune memory, that would be associated with a stock of say immune immune complement, uh, you know, your cell cell mediated immune complement related to recognizing this epitope or this class of epitopes. Um, they're associated with accumulation over time. Um, and um, in, in, in hysteresis where the system remembers its past. They lead to inertia and they can give rise to delays. When there's a long delay, it's simply because there's a stock which needs to be filled up, for example, or decayed down to a certain level. Um, state changes. So stocks are about the current state of the system. The change in that state is dictated, ladies and gentlemen, by flows. Okay? All changes to stock occur via flows. Flows are quantified as um, value per unit time. So maybe it's people per unit time that are getting newly sick or people per unit time that are recovering, or people per unit time being born, or people per unit time dying. Um, and so, uh, in contrast to a stock, if you freeze the system and look at any one time, you should be able to count up the number of people in different stocks, for example. By contrast, if you were to freeze time, you couldn't measure a flow. We actually measure a flow typically in how many people got sick over the last month, for example. That will tell us how, the rate at which people are getting sick, right? Um, uh, if we want to know how many people, the rate, the mortality rate, we figure out how many people died per year in, within the course of the year, and that will give us a mortality rate for Saskatoon, right? Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, flows are expressed per unit time um, of this system. Uh, and uh, they are quantities which are, uh, which are typically measured over time um, and uh, then contribute to the evolution of, of uh, and, and contribute to the evolution of the values of the stocks. So um, within the within the system that we're systems we're going to be dealing with, you'll see flows represented in this fashion. Occasionally, I might write write them down in a uh, mathematical way. I would note that the flows are directly related to the derivatives for those who are more mathematically inclined. With the derivative of a given stock, derivative of a given state variable consisting of the sum of the inflows minus the sum of the outflows. So this 
is a flow in, and this is the flow out, and the rate of change of the stock as a whole is just some of the flow ins here, just one flow in minus the sum of the flow outs. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and there's a formal analysis underlying these models. The mathematics is very well defined in, in some of the most best explored areas of, of applied mathematics. And analysis of these models can be extremely insightful um, in reasoning about model behavior over a wide variety of different parameter values. It's a long-term behavior, the stability of equilibria, et cetera. I'm not going to go into that. I want to talk just a bit about agent-based models. Agent-based models, ladies and gentlemen, are a more recent tradition than differential equation modeling. They don't go back, most certainly, to the 1600s. But they did originate with uh, a computer science pioneer of great note, John von Neumann and Stanislaw Ulam, a, uh, uh, a mathematician of great note. Um, and uh, they were first explored with, uh, in their work with cellular automata. Um, but um, in their modern incarnations, uh, they are generalized as, as models that are at an individual level to depict one or more populations of individual agents, where each of those agents is associated with certain characteristics. They're associated with an evolving state could be represented with stocks and flows in a hybrid model. In our models, commonly, it's represented with, uh, with other, other types of things as well, such as state charts that capture, with respect to a given condition, which state are you in, and, and the evolution between those states, probabilistically. But beyond state, they're also associated with, with actions that change that state, that, that change the state over time, and rules for when those actions apply. So maybe it's after a certain amount of time, I will go from state A to state B. Or maybe in the presence of a nearby smoker, I am more likely, uh, my hazard rate of, to, of, of becoming a smoker myself uh, rises, right? So we have uh, actions and rules that govern the state. We have parameters that are kind of my characteristics that don't change. Um, and, uh, and then we have, so maybe it's my family connections or, or you know, aspects of my, uh, my ethnicity or aspects of my birth weight that I had at birth. Um, and then agents are further provided with a way of interacting with other agents or with a broader environment directly. Um, sometimes this is via networks topological context, sometimes it's uh, spatial, maybe geographic context often. Um, and there's a time horizon and characteristics. Is it discrete time? The model advances in lockstep, one hop at a time, where we don't distinguish what goes on in the course of a given year, we just hop from year to year. Or, that's a more traditional, older type of model, as you see with cellular automata, but it's still quite prevalent. Other types of agent-based models have continuous time, where events happen as frequently or infrequently as they need to. Technically, it's discrete events uh, underneath the surface. Um, but it's a continuous timeline. And so um, within the course of a year, we don't have to broker at the end of the year which one occurred first. Things happen at a at our natural point at natural points in time. And then there's some initial state. So. Um, Parameters, we might have, say, three parameters associated with an agent, ethnicity, sex, and income. And then when we run in a simulation, we have a population of people. Each such person is associated with a particular ethnicity, sex, and income. Okay. Now, notice what's going on here, ladies and gentlemen. There's a very important shift of, of um, organization of the model. Earlier, so here, we are dividing up the population by into individuals. We are individuating the population. We're organizing the model according to individuals. And for each individual, we record their characteristics, right? Within system dynamics aggregate modeling, we were dividing up the population according to characteristics. And 
And then we kept track of, the data we kept track of was how many people had this characteristic? How many people had that combination of characteristics? This combination of characteristics? That com so how many were infective? How many are exposed? How many are susceptible? We divide the model here according to characteristics, and the data is how many people have each combination of characteristics. By contrast, in agent-based modeling, we divide the model according to persons, and each person keeps track of their data, which has to do with their characteristics. Does that make sense? It's kind of turning it on its head or on its side, the organization of the model. Um, state will often represent with state charts here. Person is either in a susceptible state or an exposed state or an infective state or a recovered state, right? Okay. Um, and, uh, oh, and then we'll have some actions and rules for evolving them. Here, in a state chart, um, I hope it won't confuse you too much, but it bears noting in a system dynamics model, um, we can think of having state rules and actions. In a system dynamics model, the state is thought, the rules apply all the time and in, in governing actions. So, so it's, it typically we don't turn off or turn on flows. The, the flows represent the actions. The flows are the verbs, the stocks are the nouns. The flows are sort of the change in the system. The stocks are the current state of the system. And we could think of this as being associated with a particularly simple rule that always apply this, this action, which is flowing from one, one point to, uh, to the, uh, the other a certain, at a certain rate. Here, within state charts, just as with stock and flow models, they, they build together state rules and actions. So it is with state charts. We have state for a given condition, let's say infection, a given concern. We have different states for that concern. And then there are rules governing under what conditions someone will make go from one state to the other. So if someone is in a susceptible state, this suggests uh, that there's some action that can change that state by leading them to get to exposed, and there's some rule that governs under what conditions that action will be undertaken. Under what condition, for example, they will become exposed. Maybe it evolves an infection from others, for example. Or if someone's in a recovered state, there's some action that will change them back to susceptible state, and there's some rules as governed by a hazard rate, as shown by this icon, that, that govern under what conditions uh, that action will occur, okay? So state charts also bring together state actions that change the state and rules that govern under what conditions those actions will take place. Does that make sense? Um, commonly in an agent-based model, one of our big goals of, or one of our big gains from using agent-based models is the ability to capture rich heterogeneity. The fact that agents differ in this way and in that way and in that way and in that way. They might differ in socio uh, socioeconomic characteristics and their ethnicity and their sex and their age, aspects of their educational history, aspects of their infection history, care-seeking history. And it turns out that in compartmental models that quickly becomes unwieldy to deal with all of these different dimensions. It, 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 it starts to lead to a combinatorial increase in the number of compartments because you have to combinatorially stratify by not just sex, not just stratified by sex, but sex and age, and consider all combinations. And then sex and age and education level. And it starts to blow up uh, the model. By, and, and a given change to that requires change across much of the model. Whereas in an agent-based model, it's much more, um, uh, much more modular. And uh, we can also capture continuous attributes birth weight, for example, or income level, or years of education, or what have you. Um, age in a continuous fashion, for example, allowing us to distinguish you know, babies of different ages as well as adults very, very readily. Um, so here in age-based models, the need for heterogeneity often extends to states. And so we have state charts that relate to different concerns. 
And if we, the model has two different state charts for different concerns, um, a person could be in any one state for one state chart, any one state for another. Um, that doesn't mean to say they're totally independent of each other. Often there's some dependencies between them, but for the most part they're kind of parceled out so we can characterize uh, succinctly um, what state they're in here and what state they're in there. Okay, um, and these are different concerns to be in one state at any given time with respect to each for these simple states. Um, and then they'll have um, uh, they'll have uh, means of environmental uh, interaction. Um, okay, so uh, so often we'll have them interact in terms of uh, networks, for example. Sometimes we'll have them interact in a spatial or geographic environment where they interact with resources that are spatially based. Maybe they will drop prions in the environment or, or shed other aspects of their, um, uh, of their uh, pathogen load um, associated with the environment, uh, antibiotic resistant organisms. Um, or they will, uh, they will need to present for care in certain environments. And these sorts of models are readily meshed with GIS uh, mechanisms um, to allow us to capture spatial and geographic dynamics uh, that are notably rich and are hard to capture in anywhere near this level with an aggregate model. Um, so we pu put things in a, in a uh, geographic basis. One thing that's going to be very important to understand for the coming lectures particularly starting tomorrow, is going to be the difference between system dynamics modeling, whether at an aggregate level or at an individual level, and agent-based modeling when it comes to one factor. And it's a factor of great significance at the nexus with data science. And that has to do with the presence or absence of stochastic whether a model's deterministic, which is traditionally the case with system dynamics, or whether it's stochastic, that is, whether it exhibits randomness over time. In contrast to most system dynamics models, which are traditionally deterministic, not without fail, I've worked with my share of, of uh, stochastic models, and in fact, you will see them within this boot camp uh, in, some, uh, in some quantity, ABMs are typically stochastic from their design, not without exception. A notable exception that goes way back is Conway's Game of Life or Cellular Automata, which are traditionally deterministic. Um, but uh, most ABMs, in as much as they seek to characterize human behavior, incorporate stochastics. Um, and so, for example, Perhaps someone's chance of recovering over time, for example, uh, goes according to a hazard rate. The actual time until they recover is is uh, drawn from a here an exponential distribution. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so stochastics are significant, um, and they are significant at several levels. One thing is in meshing them with machine learning models, as we'll see. Second lies in the fact that typically to be confident that we've understood the patterns coming out of an agent-based model, we will have to run the model a number of times to make sure that what we've seen isn't a fluke, it's not just a chance, to get some idea of how much it varies. Does it vary just a little bit around the patterns we've seen or a lot around those patterns that we've seen? Right? Um, so. Here, we typically run what's called an ensemble of, of model realizations. Each realization is with a particular random seed, and then we run it again and again and again. And fortunately, this can be easily parallelized. Um, and stochastics are often real assets. They can explain variability we see in the world, uh, often, for example, pointing us out, oh, that's just the logical consequence of this type of stochastic. It's nothing. That variability we see sometimes that, that uh, curve going down and then up again, it's not due to some deep dynamics, it's due to plausible stochastic variability. So typically, 
rather than just running a single run and observing the results, we'll run an ensemble of runs which will give us a distribution of results uh, associated with some outcome of the model, um, some if this would be sort of an, a, an outcome. Um, and, you know, on a given, given outcome over time, we might see a wide variety of possible changes. It's not saying that anything can happen, you know, all bets are off, you know, whatever goes, goes. It's, it's you know, this is wild. We can't say anything. No, far from it. Often we run the model many times to understand how much, we know there's variability because it's fantastic, how much does it induce variability in particular outcomes? And how, how pronounced is it? How soon do we see that variability? How does it compare from one variable and another? In a, and this is an important part, important point. Within a, a nonlinear model, certain types of variability, certain types of uncertainty make a big difference to certain results um, and maybe a small difference to other results. And the nonlinearity can lead to disproportionate impact of uncertainty. That's true as well for parameter values. A given uncertainty of 10% of parameter value can have a very different implications for different outcomes or with respect to different parameters. Okay. I won't be talking about it much in this boot camp, but you should know there's another type of dynamic modeling that's very widely applied in health and healthcare. And that is discrete event modeling. Discrete event modeling is used extremely widely within health service delivery, extremely widely in contexts where we have structured workflows that are resource limited and where we have individuals pro progressing down those workflows, individuals or other findings like vials of vaccine or, or tests or what have you presenting down those workflows um, uh, and we're interested in often uh, outcomes such as uh, throughput, how many people say we could treat per day, such as latency, how long does it take for someone to complete this process, waiting times and, and length of waiting queues. Yeah, Shriol. Uh, just one point I didn't catch just now. Yeah. Nonlinear RT can lead to what? So, so what I was saying is, in the context of a nonlinear model, okay. um, the nonlinearity has uh, many consequences, as I mentioned earlier, about interventions, about reason about system behavior, ability to to uh, to reason about uh, system behavior by reason about different scenarios in isolation and, and totaling them up. It also has an implication in the outcome. The imp it has an implication for the consequences of uncertainty with respect to um, model dynamics like stochastics, uncertainty over time, or randomness over time in model stochastics, and even with respect to uncertainty with respect to parameter values. So a given level, say, of uncertainty with respect to the value of a parameter can have wholly disproportionate impact you know, in large in one case, small in another case, for different parameters or for um, different outcomes uh, dependent on that parameter. So when we have a nonlinear system, we can't just say that, oh, if we're uncertain, you know, at a certain level, we have a, you know, 10% band of uncertainty around a parameter value. You can't just say, oh, anything with that level of uncertainty is equally high priority in terms of uh, pinning down what its real value is. We, we can't do that because it turns out certain of those parameters will be really, really important in terms of shaping the outcomes we're interested in. And certainly, certain ones may be a pittance in terms of their impact. They may be, have tiny impact on the outcomes we care about or the, um, or the, uh, the, the differential impacts of different policies we're interested in evaluating. So, in short, in nonlinear models, um, a, a different, um, the same level of uncertainty in different contexts can have hugely different levels of impact, if that's, if that's helpful. So discrete event modeling is used when we have these structured workflows. Um, we have a progression of things, most commonly people within health, but also can be, you know, uh, 
And it could be uh, service dogs, or it could be you know in training, or it could be vials of vaccine. Down these workflows, we're interested in throughput, latency, uh, waiting times, waiting lengths, um, uh, amount of time waiting. How many? How much? Are the resources being used, or to what degree, or starved for resources? The resources are almost all in use, maxed out nurses, or to what degree we have um, we have very low levels of, of use of the resources. Um, and uh, within discrete event modeling, uh, we can crisply describe processing of, of workflows given limited resources, and we can identify. If we change level of resourcing at one place, or where resources were placed, or the coordination of resources, the layout of a facility, um, how would that impact? How would that impact those outcomes? Um, uh, it, sometimes quality outcomes, uh, often uh, outcomes associated with service uh, uh, service times, etc. Often, this, this is a fairly low-level tradition. Traditionally, it's often fairly straightforward to model. It has low reliant, lower reliance on computational skills and a high emphasis on empirical uh, distributions to inform it. Um, OK, um, so the methodologies I've just described in a nutshell um, may look like different solitudes. They use different formalisms to characterize phenomena in the world. Levy. I know it's different, like one is focusing on the workflow, but I just think of the kind of work, the questions that, given that model, mm -hmm. I should be more thinking of the system dynamics yeah. or distributed there. That's a good question. And um, it kind of answers a very similar question, is the rate of change, how much and how many, so I don't know when I should go for one. Yeah, so it's a good question. It, it turns out, so, so those, it's, it's very interesting because those two traditions both originated um, as a, they both originated in a desire to contribute to greater uh, business effectiveness and, and efficiency at some level um, at about the same time, so the late 50s, uh, early 60s, Jay Forrester at MIT. Um, who was a cybernetics pioneer before that, invented core memory and, and was a, 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 a computer pioneer um, of great note. Um, my grandfather helped to supervise him. Another thing, but, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, on, on the flip side, uh, uh, Tocher uh, for the general simulation program. It's interesting, System Dynamics takes a very different level of perspective to the system. And system dynamics, uh, as George Richardson says, um, there's a certain distance to the system um, achieved. There's a very particular, I think it's George Richardson's, um, sort of a particular distance achieved where we're close enough to see patterns over time, but we're too, we're, we're, we try to stay at a distance, we don't get involved in an individual events. Like particular events that occur, okay? And so we're characterizing over time the sort of patterns by which this stock is, is or this flow is, is, you know, changed by this stock or that stock. And we're not getting involved whether this particular person got sick or how particular long they've been in this queue or how particular long they've, um, you know, been waiting or what have you. Um, and, and so system dynamics tends towards a higher level of characterization, trying to capture those patterns, but abstract the way for the events. Discrete event modeling, or discrete event simulation, as its name suggests, is all about those events. And it, and it tends to be much lower level in its characterization of a process. Now, that being said, you can construct, from a discrete event model, you can construct the system dynamics characterization that captures many of the same things. At a practical level, pragmatic level, you will find that how you characterize resource availability is quite different in system dynamics, very different. Like, 
how, how we characterize, remember, the discrete event model is used for resource limited workflows. So when resources limit how quickly individuals can progress down a workflow, for example. System dynamics modeling can represent that. It just tends to be done in a different way. And it, again, abstracts away from individuals. In system dynamics, we can have 0.1 individual waiting for a service. And Cheryl knows um, we actually have a paper of some significance um, on this because it can lead to sometimes misleading implications in epidemiological context because you argue, okay, you know, there's 0.0001 person with uh, drug-resistant gonorrhea in this population and therefore it's breeding, you know, uh, it's breeding over time and it goes to 0.001 and it goes to 0.01 and it goes to 0.1 and it goes to 1 and it goes to 10. And, and so you could never really drive it out uh, using, uh, using um, unless you sort of, uh, you know, uh, ham handedly uh, force it in some sort of way. And, and, um, and discrete event modeling is all about like, Okay, is there or is there not someone waiting and how many people? The screen event modeling, it's really quite specialized for resource limited workflows. You can try to use it for other purposes, but it tends to be a it tends to be a kind of awkward fit for general purpose modeling. And, you know, if you have if you're characterizing the flow of some entities down some resource limited workflow. Or, or parallel set of workflows, even if they have loops, even if they have conditionals, it can be a wonderfully expressive tool. But if you want to characterize you know, the dynamics of aquatic reservoirs as influencing risk of cholera infection and uh, uh, behavioral dynamics due to different perceptions of the situation on the part of agents, and, and critically, where, where discrete event modeling does not try to particularly hold a candle, but system dynamics generally includes quite a bit of representation as not only continuous quantities, but also uh, interactions, okay? In discrete event modeling, one entity flowing down that workflow influences another entity in a very particular way, a very specific way. It keeps it waiting or not, okay? And so, I am kept waiting for the uh, to go in for my x-ray for my broken foot because someone else is in there first. And I'm waiting for that person. Once they clear out, I can go in. That's how we interact as agents. They don't interact by saying, uh, you're going to get terribly sick in this emergency room. That foot I broke. You know, uh, just go home and get some rest. Um, you know, agents aren't interacting, affecting each other's perception. They're not, they don't have that they're not affecting each other's beliefs. They're not spreading infection to each other, typically, in a discrete event modeling. They're keeping each other waiting for resources. And it's exquisite at expressing that concisely, expressively, um, transparently. But it tends to get very awkward when you have less structured processes and we have a lot of agent interactions with each other or with the environment. And when you have continuous quantities that, well, well, okay, there, there can be batching and <laughs> I sure will love hamburgers, but, um, uh, <laughs> uh, but there, there, there can be ways of dealing with co for continuous quantities and so on, but, it, but in its traditional form, it tends to be individuated agents and resources, yeah. Um, so, just, so then for system dynamic and agent-based model, yeah. they both go rely by states, yeah. rules, and actions, Oh, we don't apply, like, not, not for district events, right? Oh, no, actually, they are governed by states, rules, and actions. So, so like, um, people are in queues. Um, uh, the, the, there's a rule affecting whether they can come to the next. There's an action by which they can advance and the rule that limits their advance based on the availability of a resource downstream. And so there is a state. There are actions that change the state in terms of people moving, and there are rules that govern those actions, typically in terms of resource availability and, and including, and, and you know, capacity of a resource downstream or that's needed for them to proceed, uh, whether that's available. So actually, this has states, actions, and resources just of a very specific sort. Yeah. 
I hope that's helpful. Question, yes? Should we have a health fix? Uh, I think that's a good idea, yeah. I, I wouldn't be objecting to one myself. Okay, I'll just, um, I'll just uh, mention um, a few closing words here. System science methodologies um, uh, are, they use different languages for describing the world, but most importantly, they seek to answer different types of questions. And I don't have time to go into this right now because, because I stand between you and a health break. Um, but... Um, if you're interested in this question, like what questions are they best suited, laid out to advance? I'd be glad to discuss this uh, separately. So I will tell you, I've, I've built dozens of models of all these hundreds of agent based and system dynamics. Um, I can tell you with conviction and on the basis of direct experience that if someone tells you that any one system science methodology is the one methodology to rule them all, don't, don't trust that. Um, it's not the case. They, they have complementary strengths. They have complementary insights. They have complementary goals. And it's not the case that any offers a replacement for the others. But very notably, significant synergies can be secured by using combinations of methodologies. And indeed, my boot camp next, next month, in late August, is devoted to age-based and hybrid modeling where we talk about hybrid methodologies. And they are awesome. And the capacity to build a hybrid model allows in different areas of the model to use the right tool for the job. And as you learn from the model, because models are learning processes, as you learn, you can change what, which areas of the system to use what, what approach for. And weave them together in a way that that uh, plays to the best strengths of each methodology and exploits each's competitive advantage. Um, um, okay, so key take home messages. Models, dynamic models express hypotheses about processes underlying behavior in the world. Models help us understand how diverse factors relate to health outcomes combined to yield observed patterns. Um, uh, so how do different underlying, positive underlying relationships causally yield observed patterns, and how interventions might affect outcomes. Models are specific to purpose, like maps. They are simplifications world whose simplifications are specific to purpose. And multiple modeling types offer complementary advantages for describing processes. Um, and some of the greatest promise comes from hybrid approaches. We will now take a break, and after the break, we will go and talk about aspects of data science and data science perspective on the world, the relationship between data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and big data, which will put us in good shape to talk about health big data. And then, after lunch, once you your bodies have, have been nourished and filled by by good food, your minds will be nourished and filled by a vision of systems data science that unites the strongest features of each. Okay? Um, so let's let's take a break and nourish those bodies. Okay? Thank you. Hi. Yes. This is my PhD student. Hi. Great to meet you. What's your name? Hong Li. Hong Li? Yeah. Okay. So did you both fly here from China? Yeah. So I, I have none of the students actually so uh, bachelor students. Okay. Yeah. She was... Uh, so rejected, yeah. Oh, the visa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Did you get a letter from us? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah, I guess that, that girl I'm was sorry. rejected by both by Canada and U.S. Because we went to... Oh, you went through the U.S.? No, 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 no. We uh, did flight for both. Oh, yeah. okay. Canada and the uh, U.S. Yeah, that girl was rejected by 